Once again today we greet you in that name that's far above every name, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We appreciate your presence. We have visitors here from uh, Stockbridge and uh, Decor. And our friends was in camp with in 1936 and to 1938. A couple of men we were in camp with there. We appreciate their presence and their loved ones. Families here today. And good to see you and may God bless you. And you and the radio listen audience most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour. That's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preach Edward speaking. I'm hoping this hour coming up we can be a real inspiration to everyone. Now you can get the message and the singing and music on tape number 354. Tape number 354. I'm speaking on the subject today, who was responsible for the death of Christ. Take your Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 53 and Acts chapter 4. Isaiah chapter 53 and Acts chapter 4. Who was responsible for the death of Christ? Tape number 354, you'd write in and enclose a gift of $3 or more and say, Preach Edward, send me the tape. Give the number of the title, I'll get it right in the mail to you. I want you to pray for me and write to me, this is a faith ministry. I depend upon you that love God to work with me in getting out the gospel. If you'd like to have a list of my cassette tape, just write in and say, Preach Edward, send me a list of your tape. I have 340 lifted, listed here. I have, of course, 353 entitled. And I'll send you a list of these tape and you write in for the ones you'd like to have. And I'll give you my mailing address in just a moment. Now, for the past two Sundays, I've mentioned some Bible questions and answers from my book. 150 Bible questions and answers everyone should know. And I have uh, five books. And each one has 150 Bible questions and answers that people ask most. And this is book number four. And if you write in and say, Preach Edwards, send me the book. I'll send you book number four, book number one, or two or three. And uh, that would be for a gift of, uh, say, a dollar or more for each book. Help take care of the printing thereof. And for having it left, it's used to help take care of our radio expense. Now, these are some of the questions you'll find answered on page one. Uh, book number four. Why did Adam call his wife Eve? There's a reason for that. What man refused to drink water that was brought to him because three of his great warriors risked their lives to bring it to him? Number three, what did the Israelites sharpen with a file in the Bible? What were the names of two sharp rocks in the Bible? What woman let her husband down through a window to save his life? What woman could not bear children because she made light of her husband? Who rolled the stone away from the grave of Jesus? What man had another man's field set on fire that he might gain his attention? Who requested that he be buried by his mother and father? What woman had a man's head cast over a wall to please the enemy? What man put the blood of war in his shoes? What does it say in the Bible that a wall fell upon 27,000 men and slew them? Where did it say, when a man is righteous, he's better to his beast? What man was known by the hair on his body? And what woman asked the preacher not to lie to her? You'll find these answers in book number four. Write in and get a list of our tape. You can get the book. And then you need to get a brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour for next year. We're planning tour number 15. It's one of the greatest price-wise we've had thus far. Be leaving on March the 7th, the Lord willing. I've been there 14 times and planning on tour number 15. I'm really excited about it. Some of the people in the church are already signed up to go. They're really excited about it. And it'll be here before we realize it. The next step will be Thanksgiving, one more step Christmas, then the next step, the Holy Land Tour. In about three steps, it'll be time to go. And I hope that you'll plan to go with us. I'd like to have this crowd from Stockbridge here and the core to go with me to the Holy Land. I'd like to baptize old Walter and George over there and, and, and Jordan. 
And uh, if I could take that crowd with me, I'd have a pretty good crowd and be wonderful. I mean, the fellowship's great. Going to uh, uh, the Rose Rock City of uh, Petra there in Jordan, going to Mersarda, going to many wonderful places like the Dead Sea, right on the Sea of Galilee, go to the Garden Tomb, Mount Calvary, the Upper Room, and many, many places. It's so exciting in the Holy Land. It's a real, real trip of a lifetime. You in the radio listen audience, if you're interested in this tour, write in and get a brochure, call me or come by to see me, and we'll get you a brochure right into your hands. You can look it over and make up your mind. It's one of the greatest yet price-wise, and I hope that somebody will call in or write in or somebody here in the church will see me today about being signed up for this tour. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. That's Post Office Box 501, Athens, Georgia, zip code 306. And I'd like to hear from you next week. And remember, this is a ministry of faith and love, a home mission work to the glory of God. And we work together as we get out the gospel. In Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, chapter 53, page 760, in verse 4, we find these words. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, and yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. Now turn to the book of Acts, would you please, over in the New Testament. And I'm reading from uh, page uh, 1154 um, in the book of Acts. And beginning with chapter 4, verse 23. Acts chapter uh, 4, page 1154, beginning with verse 23. And, and being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard that they heard it, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God which hath made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is. Who by the mouth of thy servant David said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? And the kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pilate, Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel were gathered together for to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined beforehand to be done. Now I'm speaking today on who was responsible for the death of Jesus. Oftentimes you hear people say, well, this group was responsible or that person or that power or that government. Who was really responsible for the death of Jesus? I'm going to tell you today several different ones responsible for the death of our dear Lord. And I want you to get the message. Number one, we know the soldiers actually killed him. The Bible says in John chapter 19, verse 23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garment and made four parts to every soldier apart. Now these soldiers witnessed the death of our Lord. They actually nailed him to the cross. They actually put a spear in his side. And you would say, Preach Edwards, the soldiers killed Jesus. Well, they're not the only ones that had a part in the death of our Lord, as we see in just a moment. But the soldiers did have a part in putting our Lord to death there on Mount Calvary. Many years ago, it was my privilege to uh, preach a sermon on top of Mount Calvary. While Jesus was crucified, there's a man there with a little recorder, and he recorded that message. And I have that message on a, a long play album. The album is over here on the book table. And on this album also I have some beautiful organ solo numbers by my daughter John on the other side. Now I have the album here, but I have the message I preached on Mount Calvary. And I, there's about 38 preachers there that day, but I had the privilege of bringing the message on top of Mount Calvary where Jesus was crucified, where the soldiers nailed him to a cross and uh, penetrated the spear into his side. Secondly, Pilate killed Jesus. Pilate had a part in it. Now, Pilate was a governor in those days, 
And in Mark chapter 15, verse 15, And so Pilate, willing to contend the people, released Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus, who, when he had scourged him, to be crucified. Pilate, the governor, had the power to say, No, we'll not put this man to death. But he consented. He, there he agreed with the crowd. And he said, Here he is. Take him and put him to death. So Pilate, be a governor at that time, there had great authority and power, and he consented to Jesus being put to death. He had a part in that, in putting the Son of God to death. Now he tried to get around it. He said that in verse in John chapter 18, verse 38, he said he found no fault in Jesus. In Matthew chapter 27, and verse 19, his wife sent a note to him and said, I have nothing to do with this just man. I had a dream about him last night. And have nothing to do with this just man. And then he tried to get them to judge him according to their own law. In John chapter 18 verse 31. He said you judge him according to your own law. Talking to the Jews. And then he tried to get them to take Barabbas. And crucify him instead of Jesus. You find that in John chapter 18 verse, verses 39 through 40. Then number 5 he scourged him hoping to get by. John chapter 19, verse 1, he figured if he scourged Jesus, whip him real good, then they would uh, let him out and have him put to death, but that didn't work. And the Caesar remark caused him to turn Jesus over to the mob. John chapter 19, verse 12, they said, if you don't crucify this man, you're not Caesar's friend. As so Pilate being a politician and Caesar being the head of... Uh, the uh, German rule, the, the Roman rule there in, in Israel. Uh, he knew they'd get in trouble with Caesar. And when they said that, he turned Jesus over to the mob for them to crucify him. Then he went and washed his hands and said, um, I'm going to wash the blood of this man off of my hands. But he did not. Just like a lot of liberal judges and infidels today that turned criminals loose. Down here in Augusta, I believe last week, a lovely young girl and another person there in a, a sporting goods store uh, selling their, their goods as usual. Somebody went in and robbed them and killed that precious young girl in cold-blooded murder. All uncalled for. They got the money, they got what they wanted, and then they just turned around and killed that precious girl, young girl. Now you say, Preach Edwards, what do you think ought to be done with a man like that? He ought to be put to death within 30 days. There should not be any mercy shown that man. There's multitudes today on death row because of liberalism and infidels and God-haters and crime lovers. They're sitting on death row, sentenced to die, but many of them never die. Did you know since 1976... Only one out of every 30 people sentenced to death died. Only one out of every 30 died. The rest of them escaped. These liberal infidels, like the judges, the liberal judges on the 11th Court of Appeal, Yon Atlanta and other liberals like Duke Carcass and all that liberal crowd, beloved, they're still on death row and will eventually be turned loose. And the Bible is clear on capital punishment, just as clear as anything. And people throw up their hands and say, why, why did this happen? Why would that man kill that precious, beautiful young lady? Why? It's all because of our justice system today. We have no real criminal justice system. The liberals have wrecked it and ruined it. Men don't have backbone enough to do anything about it. And the juries today, they sit on the jury in vain. They waste their time. They waste the taxpayers' money. They're sitting on the jury. They sentence these criminals to death, and they should be put to death. And then these liberal judges, these infidels, God-haters, will turn them loose. And uh, there they'll reduce it to a life in prison, and later they escape or they let them loose. And these ungodly men in authority today is responsible for young girls being killed like that girl in Augusta and others being come, killed in cold-blooded murder. And you better believe that. This book is God's Word and God has never changed what He said in this book. God said a man for man maliciously and deliberately takes another person's life that man is to be punished and God said, wait a minute, I'll tell you what the punishment is. 
He didn't say his life in prison. He didn't say, um, I'll keep him in confinement. God said his punishment is to be put him to death. And that's never been changed, never been rescinded. It's in the word of God. It'll never be changed. And you can talk and preach until you're blue in the face. You can't change that. And that's exactly why you have so many rapes, so many murders in the land today. It's because of our rotten, our judicial system. There's a shame and disgrace in the state of Georgia and the United States. And we don't have enough politicians that got guts enough and backbone enough to do anything about it. And that's pathetic. Now, whether you like it or not, that's beside the point. Now, I don't preach what people like. I preach what they need. Number three, the Jews killed him. For years and years, for centuries, many precious Jews have been killed and called Christ killers. They have chased them around. They have put them in prison. They have killed those Jews because they said, you're a Christ killer. Now, the people that call them Christ killers had more religion than they had knowledge and knew nothing about salvation. And they say, kill that Jew because he killed Jesus. No, no. The Jews are not the only ones that had a part in it. And I've shown you already. In Acts chapter 3, verses 14 and 15, Simon Peter here talking to the Jews said, You have denied the holy and the one and the just, desiring a murder to be granted unto you. And you kill the prince of life, whom God has raised from the dead, whereof we're witnesses. Now it's true, Simon Peter said, You Jews kill Jesus. Those religious leaders did so. They led and putting Jesus there, they had a part in him. And in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 35, they said, or 25 rather, they said, let his blood be upon us and upon our descendants. And to a certain degree, that's been true all down through the centuries. Since the death of Christ, to a certain degree, the blood of Jesus has been upon the Jewish people. But they're not the only ones that helped kill Jesus. There's others had a part in it. Now, they're partly responsible. We saw where Pilate played a part in it. We saw where the soldiers played a part in it. And now the Jews had a part in putting Jesus to death. Now, let's move on to another thought. Number four, the Gentiles helped kill Jesus. Now you may say, preacher, who is a Gentile? Every person that's not a Jew is a Gentile. You're a Gentile, I'm a Gentile. And we help put Jesus to death. The Bible says in Mark chapter 10, verses 33 and 34, They shall condemn him to death, and shall deliver him unto the Gentiles, and they shall mock him, and shall scourge him, and shall spit on him, and shall kill him, and the third day he will rise again. So the Bible said he'd be delivered to the Gentiles that mock him, that scourge him, that whip him, and then they would have him put to death. And so the Gentiles had a part in putting Jesus to death. Not only just one group. Don't ever get it in your head that Pilate is solely responsible. Don't get it in your head that the Jews are the only ones responsible. Our beloved, you must remember this more than one had a part in the death of Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to see that today because it'll help you. The Gentiles, that means you and me, the Gentiles had a part in putting Jesus to death. And I'll explain how we did that later on in my message. So the several groups had a part in putting Jesus to death. The Gentiles did. Number five, even the devil had a part in killing Jesus. Now, don't misunderstand me. The devil can't do anything unless God permits it done. The devil could not put Jesus to death have any part in it unless it was permitted, but he had a part in it. Now, Christ is all-powerful. The devil is not all-powerful. You must remember that he's a powerful individual, but he's not all-powerful. He's not omniscient. He's not omnipotent. Beloved, the devil just knows certain things. And can only go so far. He's like a dog on a leash. He can only go so far. But he had a part in putting Jesus to death. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, I'll put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Now God said here that he would put enmity between the woman's seed and and the, the seed of the, the devil, the antichrist, of the devil himself. But he said now that he'll bruise, Jesus will bruise your head, talking to Satan. He'll bruise your head, and he did that 
when he died on the cross. But in the meantime, you will bruise his heel. And that's what Satan did. Satan bruised the heel of Jesus, but Jesus bruised the head of the serpent. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Now the Bible said the devil has the power of death. And the devil can bring about death, but only as God permits that. You must keep that in mind. And he had the power of death. But when Jesus died on the cross, he destroyed the power of Satan. That through death he might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. The Jesus, uh, Jesus really took care of Satan when he died on the cross. Now the devil is only a use for he has authority. And his time is limited and he's doomed to the lake of fire. Now when Jesus died on the cross, he doomed Satan to the lake of fire. And he'll be placed in the lake of fire where he will be tormented forever. Now the devil knows that. That's why he's working today. That's why he's so busy today. That's why that he's busy day and night uh, committing all the sin he can to people on the earth, committing all the crime and deceiving people because he knows his time is short. Now the devil hates God. The devil hates Jesus our Savior. The devil hates the Holy Spirit. The devil hates the Word of God. And the devil hates the people of God. And he's doing everything in his power to destroy and lead sinners into hell because he hates God. And he knows that God loves lost sinners. Now you need to realize that. Now God loves lost sinners and so therefore the devil uh, hates God's people. And he's going to do everything he can. Now if Satan can keep a person from getting saved, he'll do everything in his power to keep that person from getting saved. Now if that person gets saved in spite of the devil, like some of you did and like I did, you got saved in spite of the devil, then the devil says, all right, he's saved. He belongs to God. I'll never get his soul. I cannot get his soul. He's heaven bound. And uh, he'll go to heaven when he dies. But there's one thing I can get, and I'm going after that. I'm going to get his service. I will see to it he doesn't do anything for God. I'll see to it that he's not faithful in serving God. I'll see to it that he's not winning souls. I'll see to it that he doesn't study his Bible like he should. I will see to it that he doesn't pray like he should. I see to it that he's just uh, haphazard about attending church and dropping occasionally. I see to it that he doesn't do anything for the Lord. I can't get his soul, but I can get his service. And if you'll be honest, the devil's already gotten many, many years of your life. And no doubt many years of mine that we could have used for God. And you may continue on let the devil have the rest of your life. But when you come to die, you're going to hang your head in shame because you let the devil take away from you your service for God. And so he's after your service. He's after the soul of that sinner, but when he gets saved, he's after his service. And the devil will hound you until your dying day. He'll never let you alone. Now you can backslide on God, sit down and do nothing for God. The devil won't bother you. He won't disturb you. He'll let the sleeping lion sleep. He won't disturb you. But the very moment you decide that you want to be used of God and do something to God, he's on his toes. He's after you. He's growling like a tenacious bulldog to try to stop you. But if you'll just backslide on God and don't care whether you go to church or not and don't care whether you tithe or not and don't care whether you pray or read your Bible, the devil won't bother you. He'll let you go along and you're doing nothing for God. And you may sooner or later run into the chasing hand of God. But when you come to die, you're going to be the loser. You'll hang your head in shame and say, what a fool. What a fool I was. Let the devil defeat me and steal from me my service from God. And you're the only one that can do that. Nobody else can. You're the only one that can let Satan have your service or let him steal your service. You're the only one. You can't blame anybody. You might try to blame someone else, but you can't. And so the devil has a part in Number six, we find that God, God the Father had a part in putting Jesus to death. Now you let that sink in just a moment. God the Father had a part in putting Jesus to death. 
In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 4, it says, Surely he's borne our grief, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. In verse 10 of Isaiah 53, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to grief, and when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. Now here we find that the Bible said he was smitten of God. Now when Jesus hang on the cross, they know Jesus cried out and said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God turned his back upon Jesus. The whole world turned his back upon Jesus. And when Jesus died on the cross, he died alone. God could not look on his son being made a sin offering. See, Christ has made a sin offering. God caused all the sin of the whole world from Adam to the end of the millennium. God caused every bit of it to be laid upon Jesus. And he became a sin offering. In that sense, he was smitten of God. He was put to death by God the Father in that respect. Our sins, the sins of the whole world, my sins, my past sins, my present sins, my future sins, was all laid on Jesus on the cross when he hanged between heaven and earth. And so God uh, turned his back upon him and Jesus paid that sin debt alone by dying and shedding his own blood on Calvary. So God the Father had a part in smiting his son. And he did that to keep you out of hell. Now Christ was willing to come down and be smitten of the Father. He said, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That was the, the being made sin for us on Calvary. That's what he had in mind. But he was made sin for us and he was willing to do it. And he was put to death. And he came for that purpose. Number seven. Are you listening? This is where we come in. My sins and your sins helped to put Jesus to death. In Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. So you see, Jesus died on the cross to pay your sin debt. Now, had it not been for our sins, mine and yours, and the sins of the whole world, Jesus would never go to that cross. When John the Baptist saw him coming toward the river of Jordan, he said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And so when Jesus died on the cross, it was my sins and your sins that nailed him there. Every sin ever committed from Adam to the end of the millennium was placed on him that caused him to be nailed to that cross. Your sins and my sins helped nail the Savior to the cross. So we are guilty. We can't say, well, the Jews did it. We can't say, well, the Gentiles, they did it. We can't say, well, the soldiers, they're responsible. We can't say, well, old Pilate, he's the one that did it. Beloved, we can't say the devil did it altogether. Beloved, we can't say it was only the God the Father. He's the one that allowed it to be done. We can't blame it on anybody but ourselves. It was my sin and your sin that put him there. And that brings it home to us. Now people say, well, them Jews over there, 2,000 years ago, they were Christ killers. No, no, they had a part in it. But we have put him to death too. We are guilty of putting Jesus to death. It was our sins that caused him to die on Calvary. Your sin and my sin helped put Jesus, the Son of God, to death, the Bible tells us. And then uh, finally, I want you to notice these beautiful words, blessful words. We find in John chapter 10, verses 15 and 18, he laid down his life for us. The Bible says, I lay down my life for the sheep. I lay down my life that I might take it again. Now notice what Jesus said. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. So when Jesus came to that cruel Roman cross, 
He had the power to say, no, I'm not going any further. He had the power not to die. Oh, he said, now I have power to lay it down, my life down. And if I lay my life down, if I die, then he said, God has given me the power to rise again from the dead. And so Jesus laid down his life. He said, no man taketh my life. He was God. He was very God. No man taketh my life. He said, I lay it down that I might take it up again. But the reason he laid down his life is for the reasons I've already mentioned. Our sins nailed him to the cross. Now we need to realize he carried, he bare our sin debt. He carried, his, he carried our sins on Calvary and died and put them away and paid the sin debt once done for all. Now your sin debt's been paid for. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. Now you deserve to go to hell, so do I. And if we don't accept what's been paid for, we'd go to hell. Now Jesus paid the ticket. He paid, he paid the price. God said, I'm going to require a price for people to get saved. I'm going to require a price for the sin debt. And that price is the blood of my son. The Bible says, redeem with the precious blood of the lamb, without spot and without wrinkle. And so Jesus paid that sin debt with his own blood. Now the sins of every sinner has been paid for. Now if that sinner wants to go to heaven, he'll have to take Christ as his Savior because he's the one who paid his sin debt. If that sinner refuses to take Christ as his Savior, he'll go to hell. The sin debt's been paid. It's all paid for. And all that sinner has to do to go to heaven is accept that. It's not by works. It's not by human efforts. It's not by trying to be good. It's by taking Christ as your Savior, your substitute that paid your sin debt. And the moment you take Jesus that paid your sin debt by faith in your heart, God imparts unto you His divine righteousness. And God sees you in Christ as though you'd never mid committed a sin. And God sees you in Christ as though you're not committing a sin now. And God sees you in Christ as though you'll never commit another sin. That's the way God sees you in His Son. And Jesus did that for you on Calvary when He was crucified and buried and rose again. Now if lost sinners go on and say, well, I won't accept it, they'll go to hell. That's no way any person can go to heaven Unless he accepts that sin debt having been paid by the precious blood of the Lamb. And if you haven't accepted that today, you haven't accepted Christ today, your sin's been paid for, you're going to hell. But if you accept what God has done for you, you'll go to heaven. See, salvation is, is not of man, it's of God. God is the one that provides the gift of His Son Jesus as your salvation. And salvation comes as a gift. And God gives you salvation the moment you're saved. And God writes your name in heaven. And God seals you on the day of redemption of your body. And every sin you've ever committed from the time you came into this world until you gave Christ your heart, God blots it under the blood. God doesn't remember one sin you committed from the time that you came into the world to the day you got saved. God blots it all. I was saved at the age of 21. Every sin I committed from the time I came into the world until I was saved at the age of 21, God blotted under the blood. She went under the blood. Every sin. God doesn't see them anymore. God doesn't see a sin I committed uh, before I was 21 years old. They all blotted out. Now I may have some scars from it. I may have sowed some wild oaks I have to reap. But my sin had been paid for. And it was paid for on Calvary. Beloved, you need to realize that. I've given you this story before. The dear man is sitting here in the audience today. My good brother, Walter Smith. We were in a triple C camp in Morganton, North Carolina. Uh, 19, from 1936 to 1938. I came out before he did. And uh, 
I came home. But I got in a tight for some money, and I needed some money, a little money. Two or three dollars was a lot of money in those days. And I borrowed four dollars from Walter. And uh, when I got ready to come home, I didn't have the money to pay it back. And so I kind of dodged him, came on home, owed him four dollars. And after I got saved, that thing began to bother me, and I wondered where in the world can I find Walter, I want to pay him that four dollars. I kept on searching around, and Brother Elodie, the brother again, one told me how I could find him. And I found him. And I sent him uh, the four dollars. He just sent him a check. I don't, he didn't accept what I sent. I mean, he didn't take it. Uh, but to, when, I, when I offered to pay the four dollars, as far as that debt was concerned, for me, it was over. It was over. I paid the debt I owed him. And so he, I appreciate his kindness. Now I've used the, the illustration before. And from the time God saved me until this present hour, I've never beat any man out of a dime that I owed him. I paid every debt I ever owed. And for, if I owe a debt I don't pay, I didn't pay, I don't know about it. And that was the only debt I ever owed that I didn't pay except one little grocery bill. I took care of that when God saved me about $4. But I cleared that up, and I'm glad I cleared it up, and it's settled. Now, Jesus paid our sin debt on the cross. Now, you can accept it as being paid, or you can go on and figure you still owe it and die and go to hell. But if you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, then it's paid. It's paid. Walter, I don't remember. What did I do? Send you a check of $5 or what? You remember? $5. I sent you $5. I sent Walter $5, I believe. But anyway, uh, I sent him $5. See, I just sent him an extra dollar. After about uh, so many years, you know, I guess that was an interest on it. An extra dollar on the four. But uh, anyway, I, I'm glad I found the man. If I hadn't found him, I'd have gone on as long as I live and wanted to find him and pay that four dollars but i'm glad i found it now jesus paid your sin debt today and you